Good morning and welcome to our UBC Learning Circle. Art makes tangible the pain inside our bodies, revealing and healing oppression with Shreve Marsden. Today's conversation is presented in partnership with the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health. We'd like to thank the First Nations Health Authority for generously funding the UBC Learning Circle and allowing us to have these conversations. Before we formally begin, I'd like to acknowledge with respect and gratitude that I'm joining you from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nation. Please feel free to introduce yourselves and the nation you're calling in from in the chat box. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Serene Squawkin. I'm the Learning Circle Manager. I'm Silko Gnagin on my mother's side and Hickory Apache in Belgian on my father's side. I'll be the moderator for today's discussion. Joining us working behind the scenes in Cynthia, our production coordinator, and our production assistants, Kira and Nicole. Uh, they'll be in the background interacting with everyone in the chat. And finally, before we get into today's discussion, I'll provide a gentle heads up that the topics covered may be sensitive or emotionally triggering. Please make sure that you are looking after yourself. And if at any point you feel like you need to talk to an elder, friend, counselor, or family member, don't hesitate to do so. We have some prompts in the chat for you if you need additional support. Now I'll turn it over to our guests to introduce herself. Okay, hi, my name is Sharifa Marsden. I'm Anishinaabe from Mississaugas of Scubug Island First Nation, and that's in Ontario. Right now I presently live on Silk Territory and in Karameas, and um, yeah, I've lived in Vancouver for 20 years before then, and I studied, studied there for many years. Um, uh, my history in art began basically when I was around 13, when I was able to like sit still and take in the teachings from my mom, she was a painter. And also there was other elders, like mostly female elders that taught me how to do um, beadwork. I started with beaded earrings and then I went on to learn how to do beaded moccasins and regalia, um, stuff like that, like Powell regalia, um, a lot of florals and geometrics and, uh, um, then I, let, I went on to study in Langara College for a couple of years. And there I was told by my mom to continue to practice my culture within every art project that I did so that the westernized ways of um, fine arts wasn't gonna change who I was or how I did my work, but it would help me to develop the skills that I needed to learn. And then um, <clears throat> I moved on to, um, to do um, jewelry at the Native, Native Education College. I did an engraving course there and um, it was called the Northwest Coast uh, Engraving Program. And uh, we learned how to engrave, but I didn't do West Coast style. I did Ojibwe style, which is a lot of florals and geometrics. And I'm getting nervous. <laughs> I don't really talk in public, but um, uh, after that I did study um, two years in a goldsmith program. And now I do my own jewelry and have my own jewelry business and that's all mine. And I still continue to do arts and murals in, in community. So um, first off, I want to um, talk about um, uh, one of my, probably one of the most important projects I worked on recently and it's called the Bentwood Beadwork Bentwood Box or Sorry, it's from the Bentwood Box charity event from Latimer Gallery. And this uh, box was a way to express some of the things that I was feeling, some of the emotions that community was feeling around um, the 215 children that were found in the Kamloops Indian Residential School. And I wanted to just speak to that in a, in a way that was a voice from a mother, a voice from a community member, and a voice from an artist. So I used, this is like a hand, hand tanned um, hide, which is really beautiful smell. It has smells smoky and it's really easy to bead. It's, um, it's a beautiful soft fabric and uh, it's a traditional material that we use for moccasins, regalia, um, leggings, um, and uh, this one I did was about, um, it was about the mother's process in, in beating. And um, so her intention was, sorry, I'm getting off subject, hold on. 
So basically, um, this is a story from a mother whose children were taken away and brought to residential school. And she was always taught that she was to keep busy, to keep her hands busy, to keep the house busy. And she didn't know what to do when her children were gone. So what she did was she sat down and she picked up the beads and she started to bead one bead at a time. And she wanted to make something beautiful for her children for when they returned home, that, she, that they would know that she loved them and that every bead has her love within that. And that was a gift for her children. And so, <laughs> sorry, that's a bit sensitive topic, but um, that was a, an important subject for me to cover at the time. And that was uh, two years ago when, when everything was happening on social media and everybody was going through through their things. And I just wanted to make something beautiful out of that story, you know, because moms always love their children. Fathers always love their children. Grandparents, grand, grandparents, aunties and uncles always love their children. And it's not like we, we had a choice in that matter. And so it's just talking about the love that we still have and always have for our children. So. Thank you for listening to that. Sorry about that. Um, um, so I'll go on to, do you have any questions or? Uh, not yet. No, I don't see any questions yet. So I'll go on to the next painting. Um, this one behind me. So this one is called Grandmothers. And this one I painted in 2005. And um, this was about one of the first paintings that I was successful in combining um, the teachings of the westernized painting with a cultural image. And this is a woman, and this woman represents my sister at the time because we, we were living re very far apart. And it was the first time we lived like that because we grew up together. And then we were in our twenties, she moved away and she started having her own family and she was my best friend and she was having a hard time and I could just feel like her sorrow. So I wanted to paint a picture that gave her power. Mm -hmm. So it was honoring that sorrow, honoring the grief that she was going through, honoring the hard time that she was going through, but also in the background is their grandmothers. Oh. And putting, they're putting a blanket over her, a blanket of love and protection. And it's beautiful. No matter where you go, that's your grandparents are always with you. Your ancestors are always with you and they're always watching over you and they're always there to protect you. Sometimes you don't think that they're there, but when you're going through their hardest times, they're right beside you. And this is the mm -hmm. teaching that we have in our culture is that our ancestors are always with us. We're never alone. So our home basically is wherever we go because we always have that love around us. And I'll move on to the next one. So this one is the star blanket. And the star blanket is, um, it represents uh, a gifting culture, which we have when um, somebody is honored uh, for a graduation or a birth or a marriage, um, a great accomplishment, we gift them with a, with a star blanket. And um, there's a lot of cosmology that also goes with that, but I wanted just to talk about that gifting. And the reason why I made this, this one um, is because the part of the gifting is that when a person, when a creator makes the intention to make a, a star blanket, they first, they think about the person that they're honoring. They choose the colors for that person. And then they begin to sew. They sew. So, all of these elements together. And it's mostly by hand. Well, it used to be by hand, but not by machine. But it's one piece at a time that's sewn together. And, um, and then eventually all these pieces are put together into one blanket. And that process, in each piece that is put on to the star blanket, it, it encases the love of the person that created it. And, and the, the emotion, the caring, that that person has for the person they're honoring. So the, 
the essence of that gift, you know, carries something bigger than the title of the star blanket. <clears throat> and this one was um, a painting that I created when uh, my sister passed away. Um, she had passed away from opi opioid overdose and uh, I was going through, I just had the baby, he was four months and I was going through this really hard time and I couldn't kind of break the grief, but I was trying to be a mom at the same time. <clears throat> so it just makes me a little bit emotional, but I'm okay. Um, I'm okay. I, um, I have processed a lot of this, and but this was a transformational piece because I just remembered the meaning of the star blanket. And so when I created, when I began to create the piece, I just put all the love that I had for my sister. And I started with this, the middle part. And then I did the white. And then I did the gray. And you could see how on a white canvas, it starts to transform. Then I did the orange. And the yes, yellow, and then the brown. And then it started to get bigger and bigger. And throughout this process, each with each element that I was painting, I started to heal more and more and push my grief into love and into beautiful memories and process it that way. Um, yeah, and that's the star blanket, the healing star blanket for my sister. That's beautiful. Thank you. So the next um, image that I wanted to talk about was, this is more of a celebratory one because it's really good to, I believe to balance out the hard stuff and the celebration stuff. Like you have to have a balance of struggle and celebration and joy. That's just, that's part of life. And um, to talk about only the trauma, it's, um, it's too difficult because it's actually not realistic because there's always so, so much beautiful things in it. Even through, when you're going through hard stuff, there's, there's family that comes around. You know, there's always love. There's always ways you can see the beauty in the struggle. Um, yeah, so it's my next piece is uh, The Creator's Gift is a painting that you have on online. Or, there it is. So this one, this is the creator's gift. And this was about my baby, my son that was born and gifted to us from the creator. And I prayed for him for many years. And one year I was finally lucky enough to get pregnant. And that was in 2017 and he was born in 2018. And I know that he was my blessing and he was my gift. Even though I was going through those hard things, he was the beautiful thing and all of that struggle and all that hard time. And he still is, he's, he's, my, he's my little blessing. And it's about the love that we have for our children. And it's also about, <clears throat> excuse me, it's also about the love that your parents have for you. And it's the love that your grandparents have for you. And it's the love that our community we have for each other. And it's just about that bond and that beautiful feeling. Yeah. And that's what that's about. And it's there's the universes behind him because he's so close to the creator at that time when he's brand new. Thank you. Um, and then I'll move on to the next one. The next one is the Heartberry Gatherers. So this one I just finished. Um, it took me a year to finish this one. It's actually uh, five feet tall and seven feet across. It was like gigantic, <laughs> but it was in my kitchen, like my on my kitchen wall for the whole year. And finally, this is my goal for this year to finish it for the new year. And really it's about, it is about coming through, you know, all those difficult times and um, coming back together, like, you know, COVID and isolation. And this is the opposite of it. This is like, getting back to your family. This is like forgetting about all the stress of the world and enjoying picking berries with your kids and the sweetness. And in our culture, the, the heart berry is in every ceremony and it's, um, it represents your heart and the love. And uh, 
So this is a celebration of that and a celebration of sisterhood and motherhood and the bond that we have with our children um, and, in, and in community. Yeah. So celebrating that beautiful time. And the center, there's a sun, which also uh, represents the creator. And then there's the, the heartberry flowers, the white flowers. And uh, we can move on to the next one. And so this is me showing you a little bit about floral design and how I was able to take this floral design that we have in our culture and in our regalia and on our birch bark boxes and translate that into just line drawing. And then from that, you can see the image on the far right is a piece of silver. So I began to use those birch bark images and those beadwork images on silver. And that's what it looks like basically when I'm transferring a pencil drawing to, to a silver piece. And we can move on to the next one. So this one is um, uh, a series that's basic, uh, that's based from the tops of the birch bark boxes that we have. I'm usually made out of porcupine quill um, and they're different floral designs. And then it's always edged around either with a half circle design or with a triangle cutout design. So that's like a geometric and the triangle actually, the row of triangle that goes around that represents a village because each one of those triangles is like a home, like a wigwam or it could be a teepee, but it's all encased around. And then in the center is the florals. We do a lot of florals because we create what we see, the beauty that we see in nature. And uh, the first thing you see when the snow melts is these new buds and these new flowers coming out. So it's a really exciting time, the springtime when everything blooms and, and that's what, that, what, what the florals are related to. Um, and that's about it for my presentation. I could go on to talk to, about some more things if you have any questions. Yeah, we have a few questions here. Um, I'm just gonna open them up here. Um, the first question is, uh, what inspired you to share in such a vulnerable and generous way today? Um, a participant appreciates you sharing and thanks you. Oh, thank you. Well, I really just wanted to be honest and uh, share a little bit about my process and, you know, empower um, others to create art in that way because art is challenging in its own sense, but it's also transformational that, that you can create the life you want. You can create the emotions that you want. You can get things out through painting, through creating. So I just wanted to share that that's, that's a way that you could process grief and, and you can make something beautiful out of it. You know, and that grief is, is, is beautiful in itself, is a beautiful process. It's very challenging, but the feeling that you get out of it is you, when you get through it, you, you recognize the love. It's really love. It's just the opposite side of love. It's the love that you can't express, you know, and then connecting to that grief, you're letting that person know that you just, you just love them so much. And that's it's a beautiful thing. I love that. I love that you, um, you're so eloquent with the way you um, speak about grief. And uh, I know you were talking about losing your sister and how that's um, made you experience grief and how it must have been hard to not have actually share the love with her but like actually expressing it through your art is really beautiful you've done like an amazing job with your art and the heart barriers one I was so stunned and so beautiful and like it must take so much love to like put into each little heart like for the berry and um, especially the family too like you seem like you're very close with your family and um, close with your community and 
yeah, it's really gorgeous. I love it. Thank you. I really understand and believe, and I talk to my sisters about this all the time. We believe in strengthening our bond and learning to grow and learning to be better people for ourselves and before our children, because we, we knew how it was to be, you know, to have trauma and we had hard childhoods. We knew how it was to be hungry and we knew that the, the bond that we had and the togetherness and the strength of community is the, is the major part that helps you grow through life. It makes you stronger. And when you don't have community, you suffer. Like when my sister and my, myself were living so far away, we had a hard time. But when we came together, we just, we felt so much stronger. And, and I just, I do want to share that. I know that there's a lot of families that go through separation, um, that go through moving, you know, from city to city or people live across the country. But wherever you are, creating, um, creating your own sense of community and your own sense of family where you are is really important and fundamental for your own strength. Mm -hmm. um, I have a personal question here. How does um, art create community development in, from your experiences? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, from basically from creating a safe space for people to create, art and um, share in learning and then you you you're creating an opportunity for learning also creating bonds between the teachers and the students you're you're creating um, the opportunity to have peer mentorship and you're creating friendships so create I think the most important part of creating arts and community is creating that safe space for people to come and feel safe and feel supported and um, because the world is difficult and the world is challenging and sometimes people's homes are challenging too. So having that space that is safe, that is inclusive, that is supportive and where that's what is expected of the people that come there too, then that's where you create, that's where you create growth and you create beauty and you create strength and bonds. That's creating its own community in itself too. And then you're connecting also to whatever arts you're teaching. So if it's traditional arts, you're connecting to those traditional ways of creating. And then you're connecting to an old way of living too, right? Yeah, definitely. Like um, I know our arts have um, kind of been our way of passing on some of our um, oral history too, is like um, through beading um, or like, you know how you had your painting there like that spoke a lot of volumes about community and um gathering and connection and um creating that safe space for community and and that that's what I gathered from that that image it was um really it really moved me I really liked it a lot and um yeah um we have another question here um can you talk about starting a healing art journey? And do you suggest everyday practice or when you're feeling inspired? Um, so mm, um, I know I did the first, the, the green painting. I did that when I was younger, my twenties. And then my thirties, I started, uh, I was really interested in working on my own stuff like working on my life I knew I needed to change some things in my life and um some relationships in my life too so I went to seek a counselor and I found out that I could take art therapy so I was like that that sounds like something amazing <laughs> so um so I took art therapy and um my art therapist actually her name is Jane Kane and um she she's still works as an art therapist and she's taught many people now um, but she basically helped me to develop the vocabulary around the trauma and the things that I was going through but also taught me how to flip it and how to work through it and not have things um, not have the difficult times stop me from creating so I was able to push through 
anything that came in my way by the teachings that she gave me through art. And I was able to, you know, develop a language with, um, with visual art. And what, what I really focus on now, because I have been through a lot of trauma in my whole life, my adult life too, that the, impo the important thing is building community and building the sisterhood and building the brotherhood, building that network, you know, and, and creating a better life for young people. And I, that's like my life goal now is doing that through arts and um, yeah, and sharing um, and even creating, I was gonna say, changing the subject, sorry. <laughs> but like even the process of, you know, like back to my beadwork, the process of sitting there and, and learning how to bead one little tiny bead at a time, even learning how to thread a needle and tying a knot, like learning all these things that make you kind of be in the present and um, put an intention to learn and make mistakes. Like you're gonna get your thread knotted up so many times. If you, if you cut your thread like this big, then you won't get it knotted up as much. But if you cut your thread like this big, <laughs> you know, it's gonna get knotted up. You're just gonna get frustrated and then you're gonna have to cut it and start trying it again. But that's a learning process and learning patience like through beadwork is like probably the best patience teacher <laughs> in the world. But, yeah. But I, I think if you're successful in making a one piece, you can see like there's so much learning in that one piece, right? Yeah, definitely. I love the that you were saying the intentionality that you put into it. Um, I know even with cooking, we have that. Um, you can only cook if you're having good thoughts and like when you're cooking for other people. And oh, so yeah. you have to be in that, that good intentional mood. But I think it's uh, also um, is something when we do with our art too, like you usually put your good thoughts into it um, and then you see the beauty in it more than if you're just doing it because you have to do it, right? Like it's something that you want to do, right? And, yeah. I yeah. mean, you can, you can also with, well, the good thing about art is you can also put like your negative stuff in there too. And then you don't have to show anybody, um, but you can put your really difficult things in there. Um, mm -hmm. I could show you, I'll show you a piece. Hold on. This is um, a piece that this some old, old drawings that I did, but this is something I was processing through art therapy. And this is about my wanting to change my life and I would I was feeling all this all this judgment for me um choosing to leave this person that I was with and people not believing my story and and I just I didn't know how to put it into words but then I thought if I could just put how I'm feeling onto paper then it just it makes it real because it the feeling not necessarily like you don't necessarily connect to the feeling um, and understand it but when you put it into a visual you can understand the emotion behind it you feel like you feel the pain from other people judging you you feel the pain from other people backlashing you and talking behind your back you know and it was just about I needed to just acknowledge what I was experiencing at that time and and now I think it's pretty beautiful you know because yeah. I'm not I'm not I'm not hurt like that anymore I'm standing up and I'll look anybody in the face now. But at the time I was in chain, you know, I felt like I was making the wrong choice. So I wasn't sure, but that yeah. was a transformational time. Yeah. I really like it. I like the contrast between the, the dark and the light and then the dark and the light on the, the person uh, that's kneeling down there and um, kind of lightening up on the dark side and kind of darkening up on the light side and kind of balancing each other out and um mm -hmm. uh, I really like it and um I have an after one I have an after drawing like I did a couple weeks after but this okay. one was um this one's more of a transformational piece so yeah. this is like the negative things that I was was affecting me at the time you mm -hmm. see and then it was like kind of a dark the darkness that was following me and, and that I'm wearing a bandolier bag there this is a picture like a self-portrait and mm -hmm. I'm and I can I can see that there is there is light here I can see that there's beautiful things ahead of me and that I just need to leave those things behind 
and I don't need to take them with me. Mm-hmm. I can just leave those things, and I can choose a different path. And I think at any moment in your life, you can choose a different path. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you can see almost the lights kind of pulling her into the light, and um, you can see the the dark kind of exiting. That's yeah. I like the flow of it. And that's the transformation. Um, and yeah, and if you're in that space where you're in the middle before you make your d- decision, you, you know, you can always choose an easier, lighter path. You don't have to stay in the darkness. You don't have to stay in the struggle, whatever it is you're struggling with. Mm-hmm. That leads us into our next question. Okay. Um, so this person says they love your pieces and they're impressed at, by how different mediums you've taken the time to learn. Do you have recommendations for people to look into process emotions through art, but don't necessarily have the skills? And how do you find the mediums that work for you? Um, if you wanted to do really healing through art, I would recommend um, learning about um, art therapy or um, seeing if you can um, get to see an art therapist. There's many of them in in the Lower Mainland that you could see, and and they they've all taken an extensive training in both therapy and then art therapy because it's like an extension. So um, they could teach you uh, basically how to change emotion and process into a visual form. Um, and and I would say if you want to start, just start today. Like start with an image and a pencil and a paper and see what you come up with. If your intention is to learn more about um, emotions and art, you just create an image that represents that. If if you wanna um, learn how to do healing, teach other people to like, if you wanna be an art therapist, then maybe create an image that says that. And Mm -hmm. that's really where it starts is like creating an image that puts your intention from this day forward, this is a goal that you want. This is a vision that you want. And you gotta put it in a visual sense. And that's what creates the door opening. And then things will start coming your way. Um, And you start looking, keep your eyes open, look for the opportunities that get you to where you wanna be. And tobacco always helps too. (laughs) Put some tobacco down, put your intention down what you wanna do, who you wanna work with, what you wanna learn, and then um, and then just look. You'll see these things are, are gonna come your way and believe in that part. Like that's like part of the universe or the creator or whatever you choose to call it. It's that energy that you put out there, you, you're asking for something to come your way then um, wait for it to come your way and then also start making steps towards that and then things will unfold the way they're supposed to. Mm, Thank you. Um, We have another question that's kind of related to your um, other pieces that you just showed us. Um, When you make a piece, do you encounter strong emotions? And if so, do you process the feelings and does it affect making the piece or do you need to take time away before you start again? Um, in the beginning of this one, um, before, actually before I could visualize it, I had to just cry it out and, um, I had to, to take care of myself. Um, so mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, so smudging, praying, um, crying, you know, you need to let the tears out, being angry, um, also being out on the land, uh, walking. Um, or if it's the biking that you do, or if it's swimming, whatever it is that you do physical, the physical part will help you move through it. And then you also, um, when you're ready, you put the intention out there and the visual and the idea will come to you. The vision will come to you and you'll be like, that's it. That's what I have to make. That's what I have to paint. That's the image that I have to talk about. And even if it feels uncomfortable, you're like, why would anyone want to see that painting? It doesn't matter what anybody thinks. It's like, if you have a vision and and it's a raven that comes to you, you got to paint a raven. And then as you paint it, the story will come to you why you had to paint it. 
Do you know what I mean? Like that, that visual will show itself to you, whether it's in daydream or in night dream or in like ceremony. And then you paint that image, you create that image. And then as you're creating, that's when the teaching comes. That's just how I was taught. The teaching, mm -hmm. it starts with the vision. You create that vision, a story will come to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's also like um, like what you were saying with our um, ceremonies too. Like um, people will say like when they um, engage in self-reflection on either out on the land or within their own home, they tend to see, see things or hear songs and um, kind of reconnects you back with uh, our culture and whatnot, which is really transformational and mm -hmm. a great feeling and yeah. I really, I really love listening to the singers. Like I don't have the gift of song very often, but I've had a couple of songs come to me like lullabies, like those things. But, mm -hmm. but like the people that can create hand drum songs or powwow songs, like mm -hmm. that's, that skill is like, so fine, <laughs> you know, because they're they get that gift that from their ancestors, from the creator. They they receive those songs in their ears, and then they hear the drum. They get that drum beat. Mm -hmm. I, I've got a couple of paintings about the the drummers and and the, how they receive songs. Um, and it's I think it's such a beautiful process. And it's not necessarily something you're you're taught in westernized colleges or university, but it it's something that we we were taught by our elders is that really sitting in yourself and listening to yourself and feeling all your feelings um, and being open to receive these visions or these ideas you can call them to. Mm -hmm. um, and then just moving forward with, the, with what you receive. That's the next step, right? Is moving forward and, and not overanalyzing yourself and not judging yourself or criticizing, being like open and accepting of what it is you receive, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's so true. Like listening to yourself and listening to your inner um, soul and um, connecting with that and like creating something with that, which is really great. Um, we have another participant that um, is wondering how did you find time to create while also mothering? And did you create in front of your baby or um, the person says they feel guilty focusing on me when I'm also thinking of, it would be good for her to see me work and create? Mm. Um, you always feel mom guilt, it's funny. Like, I don't know where that comes from, but like, we're supposed to do this or we're supposed to do that. This is how we're supposed to be like, and there's no actual book, there's no rules. You just, you mother the best way you can. And actually um, he was, I took it probably about three months to paint this, but I remember um, sometimes when I would paint, I just knew I had to just keep doing it. And he would be like at my leg and she'd be, mom, mom, mom. And so I like, I pick him up and then I would just try and paint at least like one little spot. And then it got to be, I could paint a little bit more with him. And sometimes he would go and play a little bit and then come back. And sometimes he'd want a nurse and I'm like, baby, I gotta please, like, I gotta just do this one, one line and then I'll, I'll nurse you. But he would never let up, <laughs> you know, he doesn't have patience, he's a baby. So I would sometimes, I'd be like, forget it. I'm just gonna like nurse him and I'm holding him. And then I'm painting at the same time and you just, squeeze in your art because you need to be strong to be a parent to be a mother so you need to nurture your gift at the same time even if it's a little bit of art at, at a time you need to do it because it fills you and you need your cup filled so you can be a, you know the best mom you can be so even if you feel guilty that you're taking a little bit too long during doing this art piece it's like you know what once you're done this art piece, like you're giving him all and more because you, your your cup is so full. Mm. So I think, yeah, find the time. Yeah, definitely. And I, I feel like it's like one of those things of maintaining your own identity so that they they can see that their parent has a strong identity of who they are so that the yeah. child can create that for themselves too. Like 
like see that you're passionate about art and um, how it's um, been transformational for you um, and engaging in that as like a child then they if they start creating stuff they, they can see that it can bring them joy just as much as it does for you yeah exactly it fills you up and then it also teaches them actually I didn't um give him a brush until he was like about nine months old mm -hmm. and I gave him a brush and this little palette with a couple of different colors and he knew what to do because he like was watched me paint so often he just dipped the paint the brush in the paint and then put it on the paper wow. and I was like what the? That's pretty oh. crazy. <laughs> I was like I didn't even need to train him because he's already like learned from watching me so much so mm. that's so cool how old is your child right now he's four now four oh. and a half yeah and he's really good at art, but he's also like really fast in it. He likes to do like uh, flash art, I guess, what you call it. I don't know, super speedy art. <laughs> so he gets really, he just goes like really crazy. Nice. And then he likes to slap it a lot, a lot of hand prints. Oh, nice. And then he likes to finish. Like he just, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Likes to get it done in one, one go. <laughs> That's his process. He's like, and I'm done. And he throws his brush <laughs> down. <laughs> okay. I love that. Um, we have another question here, and it's um, the person's wondering how are these visuals helpful or impactful as art therapy for people with memory loss and dementia? That's a good question. Um, for them creating or for for them to see the image? I think for them to see the image. They didn't say um, further, but I believe it's that. Oh, okay. Um, I would say. If you teach somebody the symbolism, um, that's easier to grasp. So the symbolism, the star blanket is the gifting, is represents the gifting culture and the creating it. Um, I think it telling them in story in that sense, teaching them in story, I think is easier to pick up. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think that images are stronger than words. So like mm -hmm. in combination story in combination with visuals, um, arc iconic images like a, like eagle feathers. You know, we as indigenous people we know like eagle feather represents the eagle, and it also represents um, the messenger to the creator because the eagle flies so high, we can send our messages with the smudge to the creator so our prayers get there. So like, we know this as indigenous people because we see the feather. We know the feather is sacred, but it's like, there's so much story behind it. So I think like the icon of the symbol and then the story that goes with it, I think that helps with the, with the teaching and keeping the memory. Oh yeah, definitely. And it kind of gets those neuron paths like creating again and, and stuff like that, yeah. That's that's great. And then um, kind of bring it back to um, like the very beginning of everything. Um, how did you get into art? Um, when I was, uh, well, I've always liked art. Um, I was always struggled in school, um, in the academic schools. Like it, it just start, even starting in elementary, um, I really would just kind of tune everybody out and I would just like doodle and draw <laughs> like on my math book or my English book. Um, mm -hmm. um, and they called me a daydreamer. <laughs> they said I was always in La La Land, but I guess I was because like, I didn't understand why I was there. I just wanted to create, I wanted to play. And I think that's part of it is, I think we all kind of grow up with that innocence. We just want to play and create and make things. Um, with our hands and mm -hmm. uh, so that's where it started and then I got more serious when I was around 13 because I was really drawn to the community part of it I was drawn to the peaceful bonds that were created when I was learning and uh, with my mom I would sit at the kitchen table like all the kids would be sleeping and she'd have all the lights out in the house except for this one lamp on the kitchen table and uh she would be sitting there painting 
and I would just sit there and watch her for hours. And then if I bumped the table, then she'd like kick me out of the kitchen. <laughs> but like, but just like I began to enjoy the peacefulness that that brought. And you didn't necessarily need to fill it with words or talking, but like the creative space and the peacefulness in that, um, I felt like it brought me to who I was. It connected to me to self and um, it made me feel happy. And I, I felt proud when I finished the piece. And uh, when I was in um, high school, so junior high, um, that's when I started to go sit with, there was an elder that came to our school and she did a beating session every lunch. So you could finish your lunch and then go and sit with her. And she would have all these different colored beads and she'd say, what do you want to learn? And she could show you like keychains or earrings or necklaces. And I would pick something and I'd just start making it. And then I'd always make my, my string would always get knotted up and I'd get so mad. She'd be like, oh, bring it here. She'd just like this and she'd undo it and she'd give it back to me and I'd be like, you know, <laughs> just like the, her patience that she had for me, but she mm -hmm. knew that I wanted to learn, but I also like had such a blessing with her presence. Um, yeah, and that's really why I fell in love with the arts. Mm -hmm. um, we just have someone kind of going back to the uh, memory loss one. Um, the participant says they believe it helps to revive or recover memories or help reminisce for those older adults who lose memory or mild cognitive impairment and dementia. Um, is that correct? I do not know that much about it. I don't I just, I do know that I'm learning still about, um, about dementia and Alzheimer's and like art and the connection between that. So I can't give you a really good answer right now, but I think later I could. Mm -hmm. But I knew, I do know that like creating is healing. Mm -hmm. And if there's, if there's an opportunity to have adults with memory loss creating, I think that helps heal, you know, and that process is just, it's enjoyable too. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you were kind of touching on this when we were talking about um, how you got into art, um, but just from your experiences, how has art been an expression of your Indigenous identity? Um, yeah, it goes back to uh, what my mom was saying when I started um, college. So my auntie, my auntie Dawn Morrison, she graduated from UBC too. And mm -hmm. um, she was the first one that helped me get into post-secondary studies because I wanted to, I knew I wanted to be an artist and I didn't know how. And at that time there wasn't any indigenous teachers. So um, she yeah, helped me sign up for Langara College and I took studies there for two years. And when I started, my mom was like, she's like, you better, she was like, you better, <laughs> you know, you better like make sure that you're not just doing the art that they're teaching you. You better make sure that you're you're constantly doing with each project, you have to put some element of your culture in there. She said, that's it. She said every single project. So that's what I really struggled with, like how to do that in a contemporary sense. But also it was really, it was really beautiful because I was able to learn a lot more and, and to continue to do like the teachings that she gave to me with her painting teachings and like how she processed the vision that she got and then she would create an image from that vision and it related to um related to creator related to animals and their representation and what the animals taught us and and she wanted me just to continue that and 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 then I found that I was actually really different like I thought that I thought that everybody kind of had a, like an indigenous worldview, but then people were like, where are you from? Like, you know, mm -hmm. and I was like, it's like, I, you guys don't know what an eagle represents? Like, <laughs> you know, so it was just continuing to practice through throughout that. And it solidified that I was 
different and I did things different and that was okay because I was really embraced in school but for that and I was able to you know share my artwork and people didn't give me a hard time about it so that was really nice mm -hmm. I like that I like that um your mom um kind of influenced you to incorporate your culture into art and and you kind of knew too that like um your indigenous ways of knowing was coming out of your art because you had that um inspiration and that feeling that your uh, other counterparts didn't have which is really cool to to see and it must have been very interesting to navigate um like living in, in two worlds kind of right like and trying to navigate that and yeah and there was it was really really hard that was in which was that? that was like 2000 2001 <laughs> now when I went to school there and um and I finished like 2003 I believe and at the time they didn't have any indigenous teachers mm. anywhere that I know of maybe in UBC they maybe had some instructors a couple instructors but at, it was really really hard to get indigenous teachers so like trying to learn how to do traditional art and keep keep your art traditional was so challenging because you didn't necessarily have those people to like you know to get that those teachings from but I did I did have people in my life like I did connect with um on not on an educational level but like on a personable level I, I connected with other artists and how dancers and people that did regalia so I did continue to do that um, to get those teachings, but I just didn't do it in an uh, academic sense. Mm -hmm. This kind of leads into this question. Um, do you have any ideas to increase the access to seeing art forms for Indigenous communities? And do you see any access, any gaps in accessing art? Art or Indigenous art? Um, any gaps with accessing just kind of general art or Indigenous art? And then, um, or just like accessing art. Like I know it's we have like the art galleries and um, other galleries and stuff, but like they're usually a fee or stuff like that. Like, do you feel like there should be a system that's more uh, supportive for Indigenous folks that are accessing these? Um, well, actually, for um for the Museum of Anthropology is a really good place to start, which is close to you. They, um, you, if you have a status card, you can get in there and you can see it for free. And then I do believe that you can do that same at the Vancouver Art Gallery, but I think it's only on Tuesdays. I don't know if they changed that. Um, and then most galleries, like the smaller ones, I think like the community-based galleries, they're usually free to come into. Um, but I think to access more Indigenous art, to witness more Indigenous art would be to find out what art openings uh, or exhibits are happening in your mainland and then go to see those. Because I think, yeah, it is, it is hard to see Indigenous art across Canada, but it's getting better. And, um, there's the support for Indigenous artists is getting better, it's improving. Um, but I think also like there should be a way for you to find out what art exhibits are opening. Like um, there's got to be a way. <laughs> I don't really have like the connections right now in, in Vancouver, but, in, but there should be, I think in the Georgia Strait and in the in, in the newspaper, there's a section with what's going on and that would have, you know, any arts openings. Um, there is, there needs to be more for sure. There needs mm -hmm. to be more teaching, there are more practice um, and more celebrating indigenous artists. Um, that it's getting better, but it, it still needs more work. There's a really good exhibit that I just saw the Robert Davidson exhibit at the Vancouver Art Gallery. I don't know if it's still on, but that would be something amazing to go see because he's probably one of the most prolific indigenous artists on the West Coast right now. And, you know, and they're celebrating him 
and it's yeah it's pretty amazing if you can get there go see it definitely yeah I recommend going to see it I saw it as well and it was beautiful and just to see um some of his pieces from way back into the 60s and like some present day stuff and like just seeing how the style has changed from like a bit more traditional to more modern and like yeah it's it's really cool um I recommend going to see it um I saw it on a Tuesday which it is by donation for five dollars but oh. um yeah we asked if it was uh free for indigenous folks but they said no um but yeah and our next question is um from your experiences do you, does some communities get more attention through art than others um yeah I guess so it depends what city you're in too like I think that uh Vancouver is a really big hub for the northwest coast but uh art but also like um it's starting to be really supportive for Coast Salish artists and um and some in interior artists but it's also like um it also has to do with I think the supporting and fat like funding the development of arts in different areas too like I don't know um and also creating awareness about different arts art styles like each region each nation has different different art styles and I think that's a big thing is that people don't know that people think you know indigenous art is just one way but there's so many different cultures mm -hmm. that do a different style of art and some are some have some similar similarities and some are just totally different I think it's just creating it's really important to create education about the different cultural uh, arts practices the different styles and mm -hmm. and uh and uh, building upon educating in those styles. So like, if you're from, you know, if you're Cree, then there should be some more support about what is Cree art, or if you're Anishinaabe, you know, there should be more support of what Anishinaabe art is. There, It is getting better, um, mm -hmm. but it could be more, so. But and it's also like who fights for it too. Like, mm -hmm. if you want, your art to be seen if you want um people to know you you go make sure you get to all those art, art openings and introduce yourself to people keep your practice you know going and keep, keep creating um and and share your work and that's how you get your name out um it's and it's about getting out of your shell too it's just you can you can be a quiet artist or you can be a loud artist so it's you got to fight for it too you know and celebrate it just like let everybody know the beautiful pieces that you're creating and share them and be proud mm -hmm. so if that's if you're an artist that's struggling with how do I get my artwork out just that's how you do it you just keep practicing and keep your work going keep learning and um, get to know all the other artists in the community go to the art exhibits there's a lot of amazing funny, uh, talented artists, indigenous artists in the lower mainland in Vancouver. A lot of my, a lot of them are my friends and we always have great laughs together and it's storytelling, just get into, get into that community and, you know, just dive right in. You meet some amazing people. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That's, that leads us to one of our last few questions here. Um, do you see any inequalities related to Indigenous art across Turtle Island? Um, yeah, I do. I do see um, there's some more um, accomplished artists in different genres, but it's also because there is more study in those areas. Uh, it's not because um, it's not because of discrimination. It's more because of like um, our people coming together and um building that art form you know the people of the west coast they've been working on their art form and building up and educating um and advancing that art form for many years and 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 it hasn't been that way with with every art form so i think it's just the energy that you put into it too um and and, and the education behind it um and i, I see that there's a lot more education in different art styles now um yeah it just has to do with like 
what is your community doing to um, support the artists in your community too, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. And then um, we'll end it with this last question here. Um, what, which piece is your most favorite piece and why? Well, I guess actually I was gonna show you this, what, this last fun piece I did. Well, my favorite piece is the Heartberry Gathers, obviously, because it's like the last piece that I just did and it's huge. Mm -hmm. um, and this one, I just wanted to share. So I did like a bunch of traditional hide shields. So they're stretched on a brass ring. And then I put different emojis on them. But this one is, this one is called the uh, laughter is healing. And this oh. is like, related to our culture and how we like make fun of things and we laugh at each other and make fun of each other. And like that kind of style, like even then we're having hard times sometimes someone will poke fun at us, you know? And, uh, and this is a, this is a goose feather. There's a chicken feather on the back. There's um, beaver fur because we got, you know, those are inside jokes. And then we got some jingles here and the, the jingle, the sound of the jingle is from the jingle dress and that that chime is healing. So when you hear the jingle dress at the powwow, that, ch 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 that vibration that's healing, it's healing for people that are suffering, for people that have illness. So that's it. Laughter is, yeah, laughter is medicine. That's what it's called. So, I, I just that. want to show that last one. Yeah. yeah that one's great and i think that was a great way to end it and um yeah thank you so much sharifa for um everything today um thank you like thank you to our guests for joining us today and thank you uh sharifa for the amazing discussion about how art has been healing for you um how art can be incorporated into more ways of your life and how it can be um a very impactful um, way to heal through grief and also just to celebrate indigenous br brilliance and whatnot. So um, thank you for that. And just before we end the webinar, we'd love to bring your attention to our upcoming UBC Learning Circles. Um, we have Dancing Through an Indigenous Woman's Journey Through Cancer on March 6th at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, we have A Poem is a Possibility, uh, written toward a healthy outlook with Rena Priest on March 14th um, at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, and then Children's Health and Wellbeing Assessment, a strength-based app to measure FNIM children's well-being. That's on April 11th at um, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And sorry about that. Um, and then sign up for our newsletter. The link will be in the chat. All these webinars are free to sign up for on our website at www.learningcircle.ubc.ca. And thank you everyone for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at our next Learning Circle. Lynn, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.